thank you very much. So we have Cliff here from Callahan Innovation, uh, Peter from uh, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, and Shane from New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. And we're just so lucky and honored to have the three of you here. Uh, the goal of this conversation is just to better understand how government thinks and approaches uh, how you invest in public capital into innovation, technology, and the future of the nation. So what I'd love to do is uh, just to go around, perhaps tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey, uh, the organization that you're a part of, and, and just the strategy that you have within that entity and, and how you're allocating capital and investing in the projects that you're working in. And you want that in two minutes? <laughs> two, two to three minutes, yeah. Okay. So individual journeys, I mean, that's uh, describing a life. I was born in New Zealand, uh, brought up here, grew up in Christchurch, Auckland, Hamilton, uh, ended up in Wellington. Uh, and along that journey, I ended up working for government in various ways, working for, with business. Took me to Korea, Singapore, France, and India. Uh, those experiences are invaluable. The people I met were incredible. Uh, to tell you all about them would take another lifetime, I think. Uh, I'm now at Callahan Innovation. So what's Callahan Innovation? It's a really, it's an opportunity for New Zealand. Uh, the government has seen the value of innovation and it's dedicated an agency to that cause. It looks at our economy and it's looked at the future as to where New Zealand is going. We can't just rely on our agricultural in a commodity sense, trading product. We have to do more than that. So they've created Callahan Innovation just two years ago to focus on what else can we do. Now the basis of this organisation is really three key parts to it at the moment. One is about giving grants, investing in business, businesses that are committed to innovation within their company. And that's usually, that's based around new product development new technologies. Another area is around the scientists who are employed uh, on developing technologies that companies are not investing in. So that's new technologies that we can then link with what companies can do with product development. A third area which I'm involved in is the making connections and providing expert advice to companies and what innovation is about and how they can do it better and faster. So the mission for Callahan is really about accelerating the commercialization of innovation. It's a very pragmatic, practical-minded organization. It is very connected with business. Business is at the heart of the organization in terms of what companies can do to compete overseas with new products, with new technologies, new applications. My role is in the international area and it's making those connections with other other countries, other markets. I think it's one of the themes that have been made here is that New Zealand can be quite isolated in our thinking and in the way we develop ideas. The earlier we can connect to what's happening in other countries and other markets, the faster we can do things, the faster we can actually make that transference, that translation from the idea, the prototype, into something that is real for everyone. Thanks. Uh, so, good morning everybody. Uh, my name's Peter Thomas um, and I work for the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, which is a bit of a mouthful, I must say, so uh, I'll probably just use the acronym MB, which should be familiar to some of you. Um, I was born in Wales uh, and came to live in New Zealand as a six-year-old and grew up in the Wairapa, just, um, just over the hill from Upper Hutt, and, uh, and moved into, uh, into Wellington in the 80s and I've pretty much been living in Upper Hutt uh, ever since. Um, pretty passionate about the Upper Hutt area, um, and I'll share that with, um, with, with, uh, with Brian and Matthew and Yusuf, so uh, that's a, a cool connection that we have. But I'm also really passionate about New Zealand, and that's probably what got me working for the organisation I, I work for today, which I'll, I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Um, my career was mainly in the banking sector, um, uh, in financial markets, but predominantly it was about using technology to drive change um, and, to, and to improve the, um, I guess, the way that the bank operated. Um, in recent years, I've moved into the government sector. Uh, I spent some time as a CIO for the New Zealand Defence Force, 
which was uh, quite a different sort of role from working in banking. Um, and again, that organisation is about protecting this country uh, and felt pretty passionate about working for them as well for, uh, you know, for a few years. Uh, and I uh, came and joined MB um, a couple of years ago. Really, the reason I joined MB is because MB, whilst unashamedly it's an economic agency, it's actually about growing New Zealand and making this a better place to live for our family and our friends in the future. Um, and I genuinely believe that um, no other organisation can make as much difference to New Zealand as the one I'm working for at the moment. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty passionate thing for me and a strong connection. I guess um, you know, overall my career has largely been about driving change using technology and, um, and making things better for the organisations I've worked for. Sometimes it's about you know, being more cost effective and more efficient, but more importantly it's, it's about making us more effective. Um, and I think you know, the organisation I work for today, it leads one of government's key results areas which is uh, Result Area 9, which is looking to, uh, you know, to imp improve the online services to New Zealand businesses uh, and give those New Zealand businesses a chance when they interact with government to do that in a, in a, in a really seamless and effective way um, and, and remove some of that bureaucracy and burden that can come from running a, a company here in this country. Um, so that's, that's one of the key things we do. Um, but ultimately we are about trying to grow uh, this country but most importantly, it's also about growing it in a sustainable way. So there's lots of ways that you can grow. It's not always sustainable. And I think it's one of the things that our organisation talks a lot about is as we look to grow New Zealand for all, we do it in a sustainable way. And so, yes, we do things like issue you know, mining and petroleum permits uh, for, uh, you know, for offshore investors that, that see opportunities here in New Zealand. Uh, and that, you know, that's a controversial area, um, but it's also an area where it does represent opportunities for New Zealand. And as long as we can think about those sort of things in a, in a sustainable manner, um, you know, they, they should be things that we, um, we consider as, as positive things for the country in the long term. Um, it's really exciting to be here today, I guess, and, uh, and the people in this room here today are making just a huge difference to this country. Uh, you know, and I love the way we've got some people in this room who are encouraging you know, small New Zealand businesses or, or, or just New Zealanders who have got great ideas to make a difference. And, uh, and the level of investment that comes from people in this room and from some of the colleagues on my, uh, on my left and right here and, and helping those businesses grow is, is a pretty powerful thing. And I think if we as a New Zealand community can work together um, and, and, and harness innovation for the future good of this country, it can be a great thing. So uh, excited to be here and uh, looking forward to meeting you. Thanks. Well, that's not a hard act to follow at all. Um, I'm Shane from New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. Um, I've had a fairly eclectic um, journey to get to where I am. Um, John Holt refers to himself as a recovering entrepreneur. I think I'm an unrequited entrepreneur. Um, I, I started out with um, an IT startup out of um, college um, and then lost all my money in that. Um, and so then decided that I'd go and join Telecom, uh, which is one of the most soul-destroying jobs I've ever done. Um, my, <laughs> yeah, my, my role there, it was when the cellular market was just sort of starting and so my role was to go um, and visit large corporates who Vodafone had convinced uh, to join them uh, and then get them to re rejoin Telecom. And so two weeks later Vodafone would go back in and get all the equipment back out again. Um, so after spending a year and a half doing that, um, achieving nothing really, um, I decided um, I'd buy a furniture factory and actually make some things. Lost all my money doing that. Um, and so I decided um, to sort of follow the, the, the mantra of if, if those who can't do, teach. Um, and so I um, jo joined NZTE uh, and now work um, in the, primarily in the capital team, um, working with New Zealand businesses to get them to understand actually how to manage cash flow um, and not lose everything, uh, and also take their first steps into an international stage, uh, which is, as uh, Cliff and Peter have said, is, um, you know, it's, it's a really exciting and uh, fulfilling uh, role to be able to work for your country every day uh, and be involved in the inspiration that you see when you, you know, working across the entrepreneurial space that we get to be involved in. I really appreciate you talking about... <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate you talking about uh, failures you've had. Uh, I'll go hours if you want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Because... <laughs> uh, I think we can really do more in celebrating failure, uh, specifically around uh, lessons that come from our experiences where we've failed, 
and utilizing those uh, to help others uh, either avoid failures or recover from failures uh, in a speedy way. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, my first question, first question is for you to, to you, Peter. Uh, you talked about sustainable growth and really interested to dive deeper into what that actually really mean uh, to MB and if Shane and Cliff also have any inputs into when you guys are investing in different companies and helping them grow, um, how do you conceptualize the, the idea of even sustainability and then doing it in a way that is responsible for the nation and the environment? Okay, so I guess a, um, you know, a bit of a tricky question at one level, but, um, but one that um, I think is really important. I suppose um, when we think about sustainability, um, or we think about growth, I think it's important that we've got to, as a, as a country and as a group of individuals, be prepared to take some risk. Um, you know, I think you, you, can't, you can't just um, look to invest in things that are going to, um, you know, create growth at the, um, at the uh, I guess, at the opposition of, um, of sustainability. You've got to get a balance right, but you've also got to be prepared to take some risks. And I think one of the things in, you know, that you see with... Um, with New Zealand entrepreneurs, uh, and uh, I guess that the people that MB looks to invest in, it's people who are prepared to go out on a limb and take some risks, and there will be some failures that come from that. I think to you know to to Shane's point, um, but um, I think that it's really important that when we think about um, innovation and we think about um, how we're going to you know grow this country, that we've got to be prepared to look at it with a risk lens. Um, sometimes we won't get, get won't get that lens quite right, and you know we might lurch you know, too far, which has an impact on the sustainability of the country, and other times we may not take enough risk so that we don't realise or maximise our potential. Um, I think it's really important that you um, that you, you do a, a, quite a bit of reflection, look at the mistakes that have been made in the past. You know, um, we heard from Bill before about some of the you know, mistakes some of the previous generations may have made. It's easy to say that sitting here now with the benefit of hindsight. So I do think it's important that we... Um, that we use reflection as a tool, but we also be positive about the future and uh, and continue to look at taking risks so that we can you know, maximise the benefit for um, for everybody. So it's just getting that balance right. Um, don't be afraid of failure, um, but learn from those mistakes and look at how you can do things better into the future. Um, if you guys want to add to that. Yeah. yeah, I hear the word sustainability a lot, um, and I don't know exactly what everyone means by it. Does everyone have the same... Uh, view of what is sustainability. Often there is a lot of value around it in terms of impact on the environment uh, and the values that we share um, as individuals, as a country, as, a, as people in the world. But uh, Callaghan also looks at sustainability in terms of the technology and the idea and whether it can actually sustain a business and s help sustain the economy that we live in or the society that we're actually creating our lives. So we'll look at um, the qualities around the business itself, the company, and uh, what it's trying to do and see whether that is actually realistic and sustainable. We'll look at the wider system, the innovation system in New Zealand. You can't do things is on isolation on your own. We all try. <laughs> some, of, some of us try more than others. Um, but you actually need other other. Other institutions, other organisations, you need contacts, you need networks to make it happen. So we're very conscious of the, the, the system, the networks in New Zealand and internationally. And the other aspect you, we're very conscious of is the international connection. Because invariably you're going to be taking part in, a, in a, what we call a global value chain. Um, a sort of like a, a system of transferring value and uh, supply demand. You need to be embedded in that. We need to see how a company can embed that, how a business can be embedded in a global value chain in a longer term competitive basis. Otherwise, we're wasting our time, we're wasting our resource. Any reflections? Um, <laughs> one of the other, one of the other um, things that, that I'm responsible for in, in MB is um, the procurement of our goods and services. And, uh, and often, you know, with the government with its own fiscal challenges, looks at, um, at the procurement of goods and services at a lowest cost basis. Um, more and more, though, we're trying to encourage people to think about sustainability in the supply chain. And whilst it's important to get the best price, um, it's also important that when you procure goods and services, you think about the, 
the, the sustainable manner that those things are done. Um, I know I think back to my time when I worked for Westpac, where I was also responsible for our sourcing function there, and uh, and Westpac had a deliberate focus on sustainability in the supply chain, and was was often prepared to, you know, to um, buy goods and services that may have come at a higher price, but because the companies they were working with had more of a focus on sustainability and on the environment, and I think it's something that government, um, you know, can think more about. Um, certainly. Um, you know, we do have our own fiscal challenges, so you know some of the rules that we operate in force us to look at price as the um, as the first determinant. But I think you know as we move into the future, we've got to be prepared to balance some of that stuff up um, and be prepared to look at those suppliers that that government works with um, and make sure that the practices they have are uh, are also you know helping to drive that future sustainability for the country and so on. So I think it's a you know it's a, probably a key point I'd like to make. And. The organisations all through FIU represent are investing in uh, Kiwi companies and various different innovative projects. I'm curious to hear how you go about measuring the value that those investments are creating. Um, I'll start because my life's actually relatively easy from that perspective. Um, because we we work with New Zealand businesses more around the educational piece of making sure that they're getting their structuring. Um, correct and making sure that they are actually a financially sustainable business um, primarily. Um, we only know if we've done a good job when um, some of you guys part with your money and invest in the company or if the bank at the end of the day um, agrees to give that, that, um, that company more money. So we have quite a direct um, market feedback as to whether um, the value that we're adding to those businesses is actually working uh, simply by the fact that the business is still there um, in three or four years time. Um, so one of the things that MB does is it, um, it provides a lot of grants out to the sort of science community, you know, to um, you know, to people who've got some ideas of how they can use science to um, you know to improve the country we live in. Um, and one of the things that we're learning a lot as we um, invest in that particular area, and we literally give hundreds of millions of dollars each year out in grants to the science community, is um, making sure that we have a really robust process to measure benefits. I think it's um, it's there's lots of people with great ideas. Um, which, um, which, which then allows organisations like us and others in the room to invest in them. I think it's also really important you put in place a, a pretty robust, you know, sort of benefit framework to make sure that we'll get, you know that you're getting the value out of those investments. Um, and um, you know, that's something that um, that I think we as an organisation can do can do more of and be more tra transparent about um, about some of that with the organisations that we work with. Yeah. I think it's fair to say that it's uh, an area we're actually learning and discovering how better we can do that. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the, the positive results and the impact on business and society and the economy. Uh, when you start looking at it at a company level, it's usually quite um, easy and quite uh, to see what the impact has been. Once you start looking at it in a wider economic or social level, that's more difficult, and that's something we're learning about. So before we go to uh, Q and A, uh, I have a personal question to all of you, not as representatives of the <coughs> organisations that you're here with, but as individuals. Is um, 2050? What is your vision for the nation? What what would it be to be living in New Zealand, to be a member of the Kiwi community here? What is your aspiration of the country that we're creating here? You know, I won't be around in 2050. <laughs> That's uh, my, my children will be, and I would want to see them happy and fulfilled as individuals. I'd want to see them in a, in a world where they uh, were not as under, say, so much threat or exposed to the problems that uh, have been building up in this society and the economy that we face. And I'd want to see them uh, as connected, if not even more connected, to other people, other countries, other societies around the world. I hope I'm still here in 2050. <laughs> we'll see. Um, I think I want it to be the same but different, if it um, <laughs> makes any sense. I think you know, one of the awesome things about this country is its, um, you know, is its, its um, outdoor environment, um, its culture, um, its, um, its peaceful nature, and its, I guess its 
its focus on freedom and equality and diversity and those sort of things. So I really hope that in 2015 New Zealand still has uh, all those characteristics, but also hope that we're playing a, a bigger role in the global marketplace um, and you know, helping to avoid some of the conflicts that, um, that, that, uh, that occur in the world today. And, uh, and you know, doing our bit to sort of help with that broader you know, ecosystem and sustainability. So I think it's, it, it's, it is important we don't lose our values and the things that um, make this such a great country. Um, but I think there is more we can do. And as the global marketplace evolves, there's more New Zealand can do to, to show leadership to some of the other, um, the other parts of the world that may have more troubles than we have in this part of the, uh, in this part of the world. So I, I hope that's something that we can achieve. Uh, like the others, I, I too hope that I will be alive um, by that point. Um, I probably stand slightly greater chance than Cliff, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> um, I think New Zealand is um, incredibly lucky in, in a lot of respects. We um, have one of the few abilities to really feed all of our people um, in hopefully a continuing to be sustainable way. Um, and our economy is based on that, so it's kind of important that we continue uh, to embrace new technologies and change. Um, and I think we can actually... Um, take the kind of entrepreneurial spirit and incubation spirit that we have in New Zealand and really actually use that um, to create technologies that will ultimately change the world. Uh, we're starting to see that today in the new um, investment um, environment that we're seeing being seeded in New Zealand, which I think is quite exciting. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see uh, 2015, uh, 2050 uh, New Zealand actually being recognised as uh, a leader in eco-innovation, um, uh, agriculture innovation and just generally as a new way of doing things. Thank you very much. I'd love to open it up. Do you have a question? No. I'd love to open it up to a few questions from the crowd. Lots of hands here. I've got a reflection. Um, sorry. I wouldn't beat yourselves up too much about coming up with metrics for measuring some of this stuff. The amount of angel deals I've been involved in where we've tranched and set milestones for businesses and then just completely thrown them out the window to continue to invest in them, uh, you know, is the same as what you're doing. If you're, if you're really committed to innovation in these, in these businesses, then the, it's the commitment that counts often. Um, so that's more my reflection than anything else. The question is, if you had more money, what do you think you could do, or what would you like to do that you're not doing now? Yeah, if we had more money, I think the question should be if uh, business had more money, uh, because at the end of the day it comes down to the businesses that are going to take the innovation, take the technology to the rest of the world. Uh, I think if uh, you had more money with Callahan, it would be to improve our ability to help businesses do just that. I was just of going to your point around the, the what we would do if we want more money, um, apart from having a big party on a boat. Um, my, the, for us, it's actually not about money. It's about um, connections and people kind of collaborating in with us. Um, and, you know, we, we're kind of in the luxury where money doesn't actually really matter and time doesn't really matter. Um, but what, what does matter is the kind of intellectual capital and the connections to the rest of the world. Um, so if I had one wish, it would be... Um, for us to be much more connected into the business community and investment community globally. <laughs> the only thing I'd add to that is if, is if we had more money, I think we should take more risk, be prepared to invest in what on the surface may be more risky initiatives um, and be prepared to see what the out of the possible is. So that's probably how I think about it. Just a really quick sneaky question from me. Um, for you, Peter, you mentioned... Um, your passion to create a sustainable, prosperous country. Um, and I'm just wondering, as far as the areas of focus for MB, how does both future trends and scenarios, the mega trends that are happening in the world, and also looking at our current social and environmental assets, and maybe the gap between the future trends and our current social and environmental assets, how does that inform your thinking of areas of focus? You mentioned oil and, and mining and a couple of other things. I'm just wondering the decision-making process there. It's quite a complex one. I mean, MB plays a role across um, so many different sectors um, 
and uh, and parts of New Zealand, whether it's you know it's whether it's in the sort of mining and petroleum areas, whether it's in you know affordable housing, um, you know whether it's in making sure we get the right skills through the immigration system to come into New Zealand, um, and I think you know we um, are often victims of the way we've done things in the past, and the, you know the, the way that you know for example, you know if you look back back over the last 20 years, the immigration cycle in terms of how we've um, you know, we've at times looked at the immigration cycle with a security lens. I think more and more we're looking at the immigration cycle as, a, as an economic development lens and how we can um, bring those right skills to the country. And you know, that doesn't necessarily get wide, widespread approval across, the, across New Zealand. There'll be some that would, would argue that, um, that we shouldn't be opening our, our doors or our borders as much as uh, perhaps some others do. But I do think that um, we've, got to, you know, we've got to look to try and encourage more and more of the right skills from around the world to come and operate in this market because whilst we've got some great people in this country and some great ideas and some great innovation we can't do it all alone and we need to leverage that global marketplace so i think you know the the immigration area is one area of massive opportunity for us um i think uh, a number of other countries who we would consider long-term allies look at look at immigration with a very much a security lens and a lot of that is because of perhaps their place in the world but, um, but I think that's a big opportunity for New Zealand to, to think a bit more broadly about, uh, about the immigration system and how we, um, we get the right people into this country to help us grow it. Great. Okay, time for one more reflection over here, Elizabeth. So I've worked a great deal in this area of sustainability and um, usually those investments look like new fuels, different ways of handling waste paper, et cetera. And it turns out that the only entities that really make those businesses run are governments that make a commitment to it. And I'm just wondering if the, the New Zealand government is actually willing to make those kind of commitments. I personally recall studying the fact that recycled paper wouldn't have happened in the US if the FDA hadn't um, essentially committed to deliver all documents and only receive documents on recycled paper. So that, that's part one. The second thing is, I think one of your biggest challenges is this concept of rapid prototyping, and I think there's a rare opportunity to advance that business um, in globally with 3D printing and the various substrates you can use. Um, but you have so much competition in that arena with Asia nearby, I'm wondering how you're addressing that for your entrepreneurs. Yeah, I might just have a crack at the first part of the question and it goes back to that sort of sustainability in the supply chain that I talked about earlier and I do think you know as a government we've got um, we've got a responsibility to think more than just about price and about getting goods and services at the cheapest level um, and you know you know your example of recycled paper you know I, I know having sat around a you know a procurement table before and um, and seen that there's ways that we can procure a particular good but the price would be higher. A lot of people will challenge that, um, and I think it's it's up to us within government to you know to think more broadly than just price and things getting things at the cheapest um, level, and to think about how we can um, we can work with those those more sustainable sustainable or environmentally friendly companies because overall I think that will um, that will achieve our overall goal and not just focus on short term price. So I think that's a, it's a really good point. Um, I, I agree with the, the, the New Zealand government and government agencies can kind of take a, a leadership role in, in some of that because we have that kind of luxury. Um, but more to the, to the other point around what kind of um, sustainable businesses actually look like, I think um, there is a lot of opportunity in New Zealand to actually create, um, and we're seeing it where entrepreneurs are kind of creating businesses that have sustainability at their heart. Um, so an example of that would be something like Wilding & Co where they take um, a pervasive pest species of pine uh, and turn that into an incredibly expensive and valuable um, natural um, pi uh, pine oil that they sell in the world market. Um, so that is you know, taking what is uh, a problem for New Zealand and turning that into a high value commodity that becomes a very sustainable and, and high value company. So I think the more that we can kind of look at those solutions where um, the, the kind of environmental aspect and the financial and investment aspect are actually lining up completely. Um, that's where we're going to drive real change, uh, rather than having to rely on um, subsidies to kind of create a false economy um, to drive that change. Totally agree with that. I think impact on entrepreneurship as well as philanthropy and um, having businesses that create more value than they consume is, is the answer to some of these things. So final reflection from, from Dan Foy. 
I'm uh, just going to, um, not, not so much an answer, but just an observation or reflection is that in New Zealand, it's, it's, we have a pretty open government. Uh, and you've heard what um, Peter and Shane have, have just said in their response. And I hope one of the messages here would be that uh, government isn't the sole source of ideas or initiative, um, neither is business. It's an open sort of relationship in which we all can work together. And I think you'll find that the agencies that we work for, work with, uh, are very open to making things happen. And if it takes, you know, looking at the, your suggestions around rapid prototyping or the impact on the environment or what is sustainable, uh, th there is no monopoly on where the answers will come from. You know, there was a lot of interaction, there's a lot of um, discussion and exchange at, at all levels in all areas, which is why we're all here today. Important point, that's awesome. Awesome to hear. Thanks. Um, I, I think one of the, the big issues for me in the New Zealand ecosystem as a whole, I've been here for 10 years, is just the lack of entrepreneurial density here. Um, uh, I remember reading a recent report from Startup Compass, which surveyed 40,000 startups across the world. Um, and the interesting thing for me is the number of ventures founded in different countries by serial entrepreneurs. Silicon Valley was about 56% of ventures. Uh, Tel Aviv was about 48%, Sydney probably about 26%. New Zealand, not enough data to even put any numbers down at all, but you know, from my experience, I would put that sub 5%. Um, and that's why I think you know, one of my personal visions or passions is trying to create more serial entrepreneurs from New Zealand, not just importing them here. So, you know, I, I'm really interested in for each of, for each of you and your, your various agencies, you know, how, how do you see us making that step change? You know, like how do we create a thousand serial entrepreneurs in New Zealand in the next 10 years? You know, what do you need to do? Or what's, what, what are you doing at the moment that needs to change to, to make that happen? I wish I had the answer for you and I'm really glad that you're devoting um, your career, your, your life to actually doing that. And I'd love to talk to you about how best to do that. Um, I've been in Callaghan for less than six months, as so I'm in discovery mode, and that's very much one of the questions in my mind. But I tell you, um, when I first met Yosef, it was at, uh, or just before an event I went to at Creative HQ in Wellington. And I was blown away by the number of people in that room. There would have been, what, a couple of hundred? Uh, they packed, the, the offices weren't even ready yet. It was just a concrete shell. And people filled the room. So there's a lot of um, good intention, there's a lot of energy, uh, there's a lot of people who are prepared to make the um, commitment and have the aspiration to do that. How we make that happen? Um, I think it's already starting. There are, incubation, there are incubator programs, there's accelerators, there's a um, number of people in putting up funds, looking for new places to invest money. And there's a lot of individuals actually looking at what they can do. So let's see where we can take this. One of the things I'd reflect on about the cult, which is a really positive thing about our culture, but maybe a, a negative thing as well, is that a lot of New Zealand entrepreneurs you know, will um, come up with a new idea or a new business venture, will make a bit of money, and then think, well, I've done my job now. And I'm quite, quite keen to I'll just you know, sit back at the beach and chill out, you know? And it, it is part of the laid-back um, culture we have here in New Zealand. You know, and I think um, one of the things that we could do a lot to learn from some of the people in this room and some of the, uh, you know, the global entrepreneurs is, why would you stop, you know? It's not, you know? When you've done your little bit and made your money so you can have your beach house and your boat and your car, you know, well, how can we change the culture that drives people on to, to want to strive to the next level? So I think that is, a, that is a big challenge for New Zealand. I think events like this and other similar events that... Um, um, that Cliff talked about will help change that culture over time, but it won't happen overnight. It is still very much part of that Kiwi culture that you know you, you, know, you get that money behind you and you just sit back and relax. Was I think we've got to all, we've got to think about how we can build a cult culture in our young people who are coming through to, to to always want to strive for the next challenge and not just accept oh, I've sort of reached my goal and I'm going to sit back and cruise now. So it is part of our culture, but I th which is positive. But I think we've got to find a way of stretching that, particularly with the younger generation as they come through. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Peter quite strongly on that. Um, I think it's it's also the kind of downside of our traditional tall poppy um, culture that we have in New Zealand, where um, certainly in, in my generation, um, you never really talked about money. Um, and being incredibly successful, 
was was not something that you really kind of talked about or kind of aspired to, unless it was sort of being an all black or something like that. Um, and I think you know what Eben was saying yesterday around um, working your way up that that spiral from being an employee to being a, um, a, you know an owner to being an entrepreneur to being um, an investor to being a philanthropist. If if we could actually kind of ch and, um, embed that in the New Zealand culture as actually people being able to see that the reason that I'm trying to be a successful business person is so that I can actually give back and, and make change. I think that will drive a lot of um, cultural acceptability around around that. Um, and I think also the kind of other side of that um, is actually being accepting of failure. Um, so you know if somebody goes out and tries to create a business and falls over, that's not that in, in many other you know in Israel and in, in, in the US, that's not seen as a failure, that's seen as a rite of passage. Um, so I think we kind of need to change that dynamic in New Zealand too. Thank you. Uh, a few quick reflections from my end. Uh, one is uh, actually around uh, attending events. Uh, there are lots of events that are happening around Wellington and Auckland and various of the entrepreneurial communities that we have here. And uh, perhaps creating an open invitation to members of government and uh, not just the usual suspects of individuals who attend all these events, but those who are actually making policy that are influencing uh, resource allocation and, and direction of um, capital in these areas. I think that I've seen this is such a huge impact that that makes when we have various members of government attend these events and actually meet a lot of entrepreneurs and listen to their stories and the challenges. And um, another reflection is also from you, Peter, when you talked about risk taking. Uh, and Shani mentioned Welding & Co. Uh, a lot of innovations that take place in the sustainability space, sometimes initially might not have a, a clear business case, but if they're paving a new path and if they're developing a whole new vertical that could have a potential for uh, greater business opportunities in the future, uh, there could be a lot of opportunities to do that. We talk about Facebook and Twitter. When they started, they had no business yeah. Uh, plants, you know, they they're just building a whole new product, but um, it, it was a very interesting, captivating vertical that was transforming the way humans interact with one another. Uh, so that's another open invitation, uh, as well as we think about risk taking. Cliff, do you have any? I accept the invitation. <laughs> You're welcome. Great. I think we all do, yeah. and uh, I think there. There's always room for more interaction and more discussion, and I look forward to meeting as much as many of you as I can today. And if we don't have time to catch up, um, then we can look each other up in, um, in Wellington or wherever. Thank you all very much for taking your time to joining us today, and, and there are quite a lot of people who'd be keen to interact with you, so uh, take your time. But thank you very much for your time. Right, thank you, Joseph. <laughs>